Namaste and welcome to my channel. I'm going to uh, cover the topic of hypospadias in the subsequent videos. Now I know this is an important topic during our post graduation days but unfortunately we did not have much exposure to these cases and it always used to be very confusing. So in the next couple of videos I will try and take you to, through the important topics and hope that I can clear a few basics for you. So we will start with embryology. Now I know embryology always is a little overwhelming but I find it easier if you try to understand it in retrospect. So if we already know about the external urogenital system it is easier to understand where it came from. So let's begin with the embryology. Now uh, the developmental period will be described over a period of few weeks. So we begin with the formation of the cloaca. Now the cloaca is a common structure from where the urogenital system and the anorectal system they all form and uh, this is the most important uh, structure which you have to remember. Uh, so the cloaca is at the period of four weeks essentially a common structure where the cloacal membrane will then form and it will divide it into the uh, following structures. So around the period of uh, the seventh week what happens is that this cloacal membrane is going to start growing into the cloaca and it is going to divide it into a urogenital system and the anorectal system. Now after this division has occurred further we will see how the urogenital system is separated from each other. Now during this period of time it is important to remember that there will also be the formation of the genital tubercle which is going to uh, help form the external genitalia. Now the description following it is going to be for the male external genitals but remember that hypospadias is something which also occurs in a very rare form in females but as far as the video description is concerned I will be talking about the male anomaly. So what happens after this period of seven weeks is that as the gradual development occurs so initially um, it is a common system and depending on the hormonal influence of estrogen or testosterone coming from the testes and the ovaries the development uh, will begin and the differentiation into the male and female genitals will begin. Now what happens here you can see is that as the hormonal influence occurs by the period of seventh week so we initially saw a sagittal section of how the differentiation occurs and now this is the um, view of the external genitals so the genital tubercle which begin began to develop is going to help form the phallus and furthermore at the period of time where on either side you see there is a development of the labioscrotal or the genital swellings which are just another pair of elevations now remember in uh, future in the males this is going to form the scrotum or the labia majora in case of the females. Now since the development is from a common neurogenital system uh, the phallus is forming the genitalia whereas the uh, urinary part of it is going to form from this urethral groove. Now what is important here that you need to remember is how the gradual differentiation of these two systems will occur. Now the urethral groove is going to obviously form the urethral part of it and the phallus elongates and it is going to form the glands part of it. Now the uh, phallus which is going to contain the erectile tissue which will have the corpus cavernosum and the urethral structures which will have the corpus spongiosum as they keep on growing. By this time the anus development has also occurred and it has separated itself from the urogenital system. Now it is important to remember that this has occurred by the period of 9 weeks and the complete development where you can identify the male or the female external genitalia occurs by a period of 12 weeks. So what happens at this period of 12 weeks is as follows. Now you have to remember at this time that there are two uh, ectodermal invaginations that will occur. Now these ectodermal invaginations will occur one on the region of the glands and it will also occur in a circumferential formation. So these two things are going to help form the uh, glandular epithelial plate 
which is going to be a part of the glands that is going to be continuous with the urethra in the body and the second invagination which is in the circular form is going to help form the prepuce which is going to be uh, separated then from the glands. Now an important thing also to remember is the development of the urethra. So the urethra is essentially in the entire part obviously of the uh, body of the penis but its opening is normally found only at the tip. So the closure of this system occurs from the caudal to the cranial direction or from proximal to distal and that is how the development of the uh, urinary uh, opening, the urethral opening will also occur. That's why if the closure starts happening before a period of time, you end up with the hypospadias because before it reaches the tip, the uh, premature closure happens. So finally what we see over here is that the development of the glands has taken place and the external urethral orifice has opened, the formation of the prepuce has occurred, the urethral tract has closed all along its route except for the opening at the tip, the penile body with the corpus cavernosum has formed, the spongiosum is surrounding the urethral part. On either side from the labioscrotal swellings you have the formation of the scrotum and the anus obviously has separated it from itself. Now the important few points to remember also are that the incidence of hypospadias is quite common and it can be different where the uh, Asian population or the Caucasian population is concerned. Uh, although there is an important thing to remember is about the familial incidence that yes it does have a hereditary pattern so it can be passed on from the father to the son and if one sibling has hypospadias there is a 9 to 17 percent chance that the second sibling the male would also have hypospadias. It is also found in a lot of uh, syndromes like the Wagger syndrome and it can be a part of bacterial and other urogenital abnormalities. And it is also important to remember that a lot of uh, maternal factors have been shown to have uh, association with it. So maternal hypertension or oligohydroamnios or in some cases in vitro fertilization has also shown to increase the rate of the hypospadias formation. Now remember it is called hypospadias and not hypospadiasis as it is commonly mispronounced. So this was about the embryology. In the next video, I will cover about the anatomy and the subsequent videos so forth. Hello again. So this is the second part for the uh, series on hypospadias. In this, I am going to discuss about the anatomy. So we all know ever since our MBBS medical school days, the description of the male urethra is very important. But I will uh, quickly go over the anatomy, uh, especially pertaining to the points which are important where hypospadias is concerned. So the male urethra is described as between 18 to 30 centimeters in length and it is divided into three portions, the prostatic part, the membranous part and the spongy or the penile part of the urethra. An important question commonly asked is, which is the narrowest portion of the male urethra? It is actually the opening of the external urethral meatus and the least dilatable part is the membranous urethra. Now over here we have the uh, seminal vesicles on either sides that open into the prostatic urethra. We have the bulbourethral glands of Cowper. This is the ductus deferens from the epididymis and the testes. The layers that are of importance here are uh, so we know that the penis is a cylindrical structure so on the outside you have the skin and the muscular components that are important are the corpora cavernosa on either side of the urethra which are part of the body of the penis and the corpus spongiosum which is on either side of the urethra and they are actually a part of the urethra. If you see the cross section of the penile portion that is what is important. So what you need to know about this cross section is the layers from outside to in. Um, so you can see that on the outermost you have the skin which is enveloping the entire part of it. Just below the skin you have a superficial dorsal vein. Below that you have a superficial fascia which is called the coles fascia. After that you have a layer of areolar tissue and then you have the bux fascia. 
the bux fascia is important because it is the deeper fascia and below this fascia that is further deeper to it you will find all the neurovascular structures so in between you have a deep dorsal vein on either side you have the deep dorsal penile arteries and you have the dorsal nerves as i described before on either side you have the corpora cavernosa which are paired muscular components of the body of the penis they are separated by a septum in between on uh, either of them have a deep uh, artery as well and you have the corpora spongiosum which is a single structure in which lies the urethra and there are arteries of the corpora spongiosum as well it is important to remember that the corpora cavernosum is encircled by a layer of tunica albuginea and so is the corpus spongiosum so that there is a layer of separation between these two the tunica albuginea surrounding the corpora cavernosa is also very important because of the erectile function so that when the uh, distension occurs because of filling of the uh, blood vessels in the penis during erection the tunica albuginea helps to form a layer outside and contain the blood within all these layers are very important because when you uh, see the description for the surgical uh, uh, treatment of uh, hypospadias you have to borrow a lot of layers from the uh, surrounding structures and because you have to do waterproofing you have to do a three layered repair that's why you should know all the layers which you have available to you so there's a very good mnemonic that i have found for the layers of the testes because sometimes you have to borrow skin from the testes sometimes from the scrotum depending on your stage of repair so the mnemonic goes as some damn englishman called it the testes no offense to anyone it's just a very good mnemonic that i have found on the internet so from outside to in the layers of the testes are skin dartos fascia external spermatic fascia cremastric fascia internal spermatic fascia tunica albuginea of the testes and the testes themselves so do read in detail uh, for all the layers because uh, when we go into the surgical description you will find it is very important so i hope this helps clear some of the basics namaste and uh, welcome to my channel in this video i am going to uh, describe the classification of hypospadias so this has considerably evolved um, through time and the various classifications uh, are listed as below so the classification is based on the site of the urethral opening and it is important because it will further reflect the clinical features associated with the condition how severe uh, the case is and uh, furthermore which are the surgical procedures that would be used depending on whether a single stage would suffice or whether two stage procedures would be required now the initial classification was given by uh, smith in 1938 and it was plainly put as first second or third degree the shefers classification in 1950 uh, classified it as glandular penile or perineal depending on where the urethral opening was present avalon in 1975 classified it as glandular again penile and it was similar to shefer with the difference being that the perineal one was further subdivided into pino perineal and the perineal types however the commonly used classifications which are asked in the examinations as well are the brown ducket and the hadidi classification with the hadidi one being the latest classification in brown's case as described in 1938 the terms used were glandular subcoronal and mid shaft furthermore the more proximal ones were known as the proximal penile hypospadias pino scrotal scrotal and perineal which is going to be similar as seen in case of ducket now a ducket in 1996 gave the terms again as glandular which is the distal most opening and then subcoronal distal penile and furthermore mid shaft the more proximal you came the more severe the condition became so they were divided as proximal penile pino scrotal scrotal and perineal again and these were further into given into broader 
categories as anterior, middle and posterior as denoted by the letters A, M and P. Now anterior consisted of glandular as well as subcoronal. The middle one consisted of the uh, mid shaft and the posterior one consisted of the more proximal openings. So since there was a lot of overlap and a lot of confusion regarding all these terms, Hedidi in 2004 made it simple and gave three broad categories with glandular describing only where the opening is in the glands region, then distal and proximal. So distal one consisted of the penile ones where it included the subcoronal, distal penile and mid shaft and proximal one consisted of everything that was proximal to mid shaft and going into the perineal region. Now these uh, classifications are given uh, everywhere on the internet. You can uh, easily uh, refer to that and we will see how these terms are further helpful when we discuss about the clinical features and the procedures that are required. Hello and welcome to my channel. So I am going to continue with the series on hypospadias and in this video we will discuss about the clinical features. Now there are four main clinical features associated with hypospadias. First being the abnormal urethral opening on the under surface of the penis. Then there is the caudy, spatulation of the glands and the hooding of the prepuce. So first we will discuss about the uh, caudy which is associated with the abnormal urethral opening. Now what is this caudy? So in my previous uh, videos on anatomy and embryology, I had discussed about the cross section of the penile region and discussed about all the layers which enclose it. So in case of caudy, there are abnormal fibrous strands that are seen along the undersurface of the penis extending from the base and these can be anywhere from the skin to the inner layers but the most common culprits causing it are the layers of the superficial and the deep fascia that is the dartos and the bux fascia. Now imagine that the urethral opening has to travel from the base till the tip of the glands when the development occurs and there is something which is holding it back. So these fibrotic strands restrict the urethra from going till the tip and they cause this abnormal opening somewhere proximally. This is where the classification of hypospadias is based wherein the urethral opening can occur anywhere from the glandular subcoronal to the perineal region as discussed in my previous video. So this caudy is of importance because it is commonly seen when there is erection. That's why the, uh, the artificial erection test is also performed to see the extent of the caudy which we will discuss about later. Now there are a lot of other anomalies which are associated uh, with the case of hypospadias wherein there is cryptorchidism or undescended testes, renal agenesis, the spectrum of bacterial or identity disorders. It is important to identify these um, disorders as well because in cases uh, where circumcision is performed, uh, the excess of prepucial skin which is actually discarded is what helps in correcting hypospadias later on in life and therefore circumcision should not be done in these cases at all. Now there is a condition which is also known as caudy without hypospadias that can be spontaneous and it leads to erectile and sexual dysfunctions. Um, in those cases also surgical correction is required. So these are common viva questions that can caudy happen without hypospadias? Yes, it can. And can hypospadias occur in case of females? Yes, it can also happen. So similarly, there is another condition called epispadias, wherein the uh, urethral opening is abnormally found on the dorsal surface of the penile region and it is associated with the ventral curvature. It is also seen further with conditions like bladder extrophy and uh, diastasis of the pubic bone and they are also severe and require surgical correction. Again, epispadias is a condition which can be seen in case of females as well and these are all surgically corrected. Now there is another condition called Peyronie's disease which uh, happens in older males and there are uh, fibrotic plaques which are seen along the penile region which lead to this caudy and they lead to this curvature. So in those cases the main culprit is the tunica region 
so a procedure called nespitz plication which used to be done what uh, was done in that procedure was that transverse ellipses of the tunica region along the length were excised and they were closed in a vertical fashion which would help correction of this curvature now nowadays collagenase uh, injections and everything a uh, lot of development has occurred in the case of uh, peyronie's disease which can also be tried but that is a different disease which we are not discussing further now now the uh, dorsal curvature of the penis is associated with cordy and the abnormal urethral opening but the other few things which are characteristic in case of hypospadias is the spatulation so normally the glandular region is conical in shape but in this case there is a spatulated opening which is seen furthermore the prepucial skin is deficient on the ventral surface and it sort of collects on to the dorsal surface so that is known as the hooding of the prepuce so this covers all the uh, clinical features that you need to know in case of hypospadias which are important from the viva point of view as well and in the upcoming video i will discuss about the principles of surgical correction namaste everyone and welcome back to my channel sorry i haven't posted videos in quite some time but now we will continue with the videos on hypospadias and we will start with the principles of the surgical repair now as far as timing is concerned it is a general consensus that the surgery should be performed between 6 to 18 months of age a lot of centers believe the earlier the better especially if it is meant to be a two stage repair now the idea is that the total surgical procedure should be completed before the child is ready to go to school which will help uh, relieve with social anxiety and uh, this is therefore considered a good timing for the repair now the principles or the ideas that you should have in mind is as to what we are going to achieve with the surgical procedures is that you have to remember four plasties so we have orthoplasty which means straightening of the phallus meatoplasty that is the position of the opening of the urethra urethroplasty reconstructing a urethra which has adequate length and caliber and ultimately glans plasty so that you have a proper shape of the glans as well some also include scrotoplasty which includes a proper skin cover and a proper uh, reconstruction of the scrotal area as well now for the principles you have to also remember that less is more minimal trauma should be uh, given to the tissues they are very delicate it is performed at a younger age you have to do a layered repair so you have to separate the skin from the urethral lining and for this waterproofing must be done now this means that an intervening layer should be present which will help to separate the skin and the urethra and helps to form a leak proof closure that is where the sutures will also be important that's why it is considered that the sutures which are used have to be uh, absorbable and they have to be uh, minimally traumatic and they should not evoke greater reactions we will see in the following video what kind of sutures are supposed to be used now the goals of your repair are that you want the child to be able to micturate in the standing position there should be a near normal appearance of the phallus and the glans along with the slit shaped meatus and for the future sexual functions it is important that the cordy should be relieved completely so that during sexual intercourse there is no bending of the phallus now the procedures that are available are depending on whether they are single versus a two stage repair now if the um, hypospadias as we had seen in the classification is a distal one we can manage with a single repair wherein the cordy correction as well as the uh, urethroplasty are both done in a single stage because you have sufficient tissues and the deficiency is less so it's depending on the demand and the supply the popular techniques for this uh, single stage repair are the magpie which is meatoplasty and glans plasty procedures incorporated originally described by duckett we have tip which is tubularized incised plate by snodgrass flip flap procedure by matthew and asopa one of the indian techniques now in the following videos i will describe these techniques one by one to the best of my knowledge 
the two stage repair is used for proximal cases of hypospadias where um, the urethral opening is much more proximal so the deficiency of the urethra is much more the tissue availability is very less and that's why in this case you have to repair the cordy in the first stage and then only in the second stage we can go for a urethroplasty the popular known ones um, are then they are done six months apart and for example it is the BRCA's two stage repair the bias two stage repair and for extreme cases and like we have hypospadias cripples we have the sessile culp technique now a sopa the indian technique can usually be, be applied to both these situations depending on how the tissue reconstruction is done so in the next video we will see what are the perioperative considerations that have to be kept in mind while uh, operating for hypospadias Namaste and welcome. So today in continuation with the previous video, we are going to discuss what are the perioperative considerations in the management of hypospadias. So first of all, preoperatively, hormones, to give or not to give. So this is a debatable question and it depends on the centers. So some do prefer to give topical uh, testosterone or injectable two-day regime of testosterone. And some centers prefer to give the HCG hormone depending on the requirement. Now, if the penile region is very, very small and in certain conditions it is associated with the other syndromes, then these hormones are helpful in increasing the size of the phallus, increasing the vascularity of the tissues and helping the area to become mature enough to be operated on. Therefore, whether to give it as a topical form or an injectable form is actually the surgeon and center dependent. Now, intraoperatively, right before you do the procedure, what are the things that you have to know and consider? So, first of all, anesthesia. So, because this is done on infants ranging from 6 months to 18 months, general anesthesia is preferred. And for the uh, pain, the caudal block is given. Some prefer to give penile block. It is done as an outpatient procedure sometimes in a lot of centers, but usually the general anesthesia with a block for the pain management is what is the norm. Now urinary diversion, that is an important consideration because this will not only affect your intraoperative technique, but it is also going to help you through the postoperative procedure for the urethra to form and mature. So what is it that you're going to use to divert the urinary stream? So for the catheter, now uh, the red uh, rubber catheter is out of date. The Foley's catheter is not preferred because number one, its uh, rubber material is considered to be quite irritating and the inflatable, the balloon that is there inside can cause damage to the urethra as well. So some centers prefer the silicon catheter. We used to use an infant feeding tube of the size according to the meatal opening and for the more proximal cases of hypospadias where you need the catheter or the urinary diversion to be there for a longer period of time in severe cases associated with other anomalies even suprapubic diversion is considered. Now this is left in place for at least two weeks when we place a catheter and at that time uh, the urethra matures and the new meatus forms over it and after which it can be removed. Now the most important uh, question which is also asked is what is the artificial erection test or what is the tunique test. Now this was first introduced and hence it is known as McLaughlin and Gitty's artificial erection, erection test. Now the first step you have to remember is that um, after the patient is prepped and anesthesia is given the penile region has to be degloved first. This test is done after degloving of the penile region. So the penile region has to be degloved and then at the base of the penile region a tunique will be tied. Now considering this as the phallus and then you have to take a butterfly needle and you can inject 5 to 10 ml of normal saline into the corpora cavernosa. Now some people say that you need to inject it into both the corporas but since the cavernosa have a communication in between them injecting into a single side as well does suffice so after degloving tying the tube at the base using a butterfly needle and using your normal saline you get to see the 
degree of cordy so this test is basically done to judge the degree of cordy which is there um, in the case of hypospadias because that has to be released completely before you go to the uh, urethral reconstruction so after the uh, cordy is released it is the fibrous tissue is excised then you have to repeat this test so you do the test release the cordy and then again repeat the test to make sure that no amount of fibrosis is left behind now what suture materials do you use so for the urethra this is very important because the sutures that use have to cause an epithelial inversion not eversion that we do in the skin but it has it has to cause an inversion so this is important so that the edges unite properly and there is no fissure formation which is the commonest complication so because of this epithelial inversion you must remember that when the sutures are used such as 5 or 60 polyglycan usually the quick absorbable sutures are preferred then the knots have to be outside and not towards the lumen now post operatively what is important is first of all the dressing now a lot of centers also say that there should be no dressing just a minimal support because a tight dressing around the penile region can actually cause um, pressure on the newly formed urethra and these tissues are very delicate some say that you can put a like a cavillon dressing or a silicone dressing or a foam dressing around it to support and you can tape the catheter in position now post operatively bladder spasms is a problem which is managed by oxybutynin and the dosage is dependent on the age and body weight um another problem is nocturnal erections because of which in older children usually during the second stage and in when the complications are managed then you have to give anxiolytics as well because this can also hamper the healing of the tissues and finally the diversion of the urine as mentioned above depending on the degree of hypospadias and whether it is distal or proximal we have to decide now the complications are quite common and um, especially the fistula they are the notorious complications that do take place and the other ones are because the uh, urethra lining is reformed there can be problems of stricture there can be problems of stenosis and when these complications occur again and again um, the patient ends up as a hypospadias cripple so that is also an important question as what is a hypospadias cripple so these were the peri operative considerations for the hypospadias in the following videos i will describe um, the common techniques one by one thank you for watching namaste and welcome back to the hypospadias series as per a lot of requests that i have been getting i am going to now post the videos on the individual techniques and we will start with the magpie approach now this technique is used for the distal most cases of hypospadias m stands for neatal advancement glans plasty incorporated now for this technique the first thing that has to be done is that a stay suture is taken at the distal most uh, tip of the glans now the first step is to do the degloving of the penile shaft by a subcoronal circumferential incision so this also helps to release the cordy as well now consider the fact that the current opening of the urethra is at the more proximal position so we have the remnant urethral plate over here and the neatal opening has to be advanced distally so for this technique a vertical dissection is done in the urethral plate in the midline and this is known as the henke mikulis incision or the dissection now the point to be noted here is that the dissection that we have done is longitudinal but the closure that is done is transverse so that the meatus will be advanced from a proximal to a distal most position once this advancement has been done a stay suture is taken at the ventral most tip of the current or the new urethral uh, opening and so that the glans which is below it has to be dissected now the glandular wings that are formed over here are trimmed on the edges and the excess tissue is removed so that you can see the glans mesenchyme below it which has to be approximated now this forms the part of the glans plasty so here the stay suture has been taken the urethra has been attempted its advanced more distally 
and the glands has been repaired from within these are mainly done by uh, vicral sutures some prefer pds as well so once this has been closed or sutured together this gives a more conical shape to the glands after that the overlying incisions are closed so that the final picture that you will get will be of an inverted t with the urethral meatus at the tip of the glands which is the desirable position now it can be a little confusing to understand this so i will give an example from here so consider this as the glands so this would be the current opening of the urethral meatus and this is the tip of the glands where we want to advance it this midline portion is the urethral plate so this has to be dissected out completely so it is dissected with the scissors and now the suturing is done in such a manner that this longitudinal dissection starts to become a transverse one like this and then stay sutures are taken at the ventral most part of the urethral meatus and it is held um, under traction and this will give a more conical shape so the closure is done now imagine that this is the part of the glands wings and they have to be trimmed on the edges and the glands mesenchyme which will be underneath has to be approximated so these will be brought closer i know that is does not look like the ideal um, position but this is the idea of it and now they are closed in the midline and you have further uh, incision which is distally and the inverted t closure which happens here so once you understand the concept that it is basically the longitudinal urethral meatus which is dissected and pulled up and closed in a transverse manner it is much more simpler to understand this procedure which is known as the magpie technique which is used for the distal cases of hypospadias namaste and welcome to yet another episode of the hypospadia series we are going to continue with the technique known as flip flap which was originally described by matthew now to get an overview we must remember that this is a single stage procedure which is used for cases of distal a uh, shaft to mid shaft um, hypospadias now uh, in this technique what is important is that there should be good ventral skin because that is where we will be raising the flap from now whether degloving is required in the entirety of the shaft or just enough to release the cordy is uh, debatable some centers prefer to release it completely some say that a complete uh, degloving is not required but as per the original description what you need to remember is that if this is the opening in the present uh, situation and this is where we need the urethral meatus to be suppose it is a length of x so we no need to know this length and width because equivalent to that we are going to be raising a flap from the ventral skin which will be incised down till the subcutaneous region now once these incisions are complete and this is the circumferential extension which helps in the degloving this shows that the flap has been freed completely now in the next step we see here this is the draining tube which can be the silicon catheter or the infant feeding tube as convenient and this is usually inserted at the beginning itself um for more information uh, you can see the peri operative considerations that i have described in the previous videos so this is showing the draining tube and this is showing that the flap is going to be flipped over flipped over by almost 180 degrees and that is why it is known as a flip flap procedure and then this is going to be sutured onto itself with the tube in the center so for example this is a very uh, rough description but if this is the opening of the urethral meatus and we need it to be at the tip and we have the uh, draining tube right here in the center we have raised the flap made the incisions and it is going to be flipped onto itself and once it is flipped onto itself it is going to be sutured on the sides to get the closure and then the remaining skin is closed by closure of the glandular flaps and then obviously correcting back the degloved uh, penile skin so it leads to a final scar appearing like this 
Now, like most of the procedures, uh, with time there have been many modifications where uh, waterproofing can be done with the inner prepucial flap or with the dorsal flap, and uh, there is also a description wherein it is known as the um, dorsal tip miato uh, tommy in the flip flap technique of Matthew. So that is done because if you see here, this is going to lead to a very uh, oval or a circumferential looking urethral meatus and uh, normally uh, the one that is considered uh, near normal is slit shaped so in those cases what happens is that uh, you need to make a dorsal slit and that meatotomy is done and the rest of the flip flap procedure is performed so those are the two modifications that you should be aware of Namaste and welcome back to the series on hypospadias. We will now continue with the next technique which was described for distal hypospadias and can also be used for cases up to mid shaft if the um, present urethral plate is of a good quality. Now this procedure known as TIP, T-I-P, as popularized by Professor Snodgrass stands for tubularized incised plate that is the urethral plate. Now it is said that the urethral plate should have a diameter of at least 10 mm that is a width of at least 10 mm and should be a good of good quality so that it can be tubularized around the tube which is either a catheter or an infant feeding tube as we have seen in the pre-operative um, requisitions that are needed in case of a hypospadias surgical technique. Now the first diagram shows a case of um, distal hypospadias where this is the opening of the urethral uh, plate where the opening should have been distal most. So what is this urethral plate? So the urethral opening and where it should have been in between it there is a remnant of tissue which is known as the urethral plate which goes down till the corpus spongiosum. Now this is what we want because this is what we are recreating that is for the outflow of the urine. So the first incisions will be taken as pairing incisions parallel to the urethral plate and they have been taken down till transversely till the base just proximal to the current urethral opening so as to deglove the penile shaft. Now what is shown over here is that those incisions have been made, the degloving has been done and what we have here is the urethral plate. Now after this has been done, the TIP procedure actually begins. So this urethral plate, like I said, which should be at least of 10 mm or 1 cm, is incised right down in the middle. It's sort of split in the middle from where you would want the opening of the urethra to be up to its current opening and this helps to create sort of two flaps on either side and this is split right down till the corpus spongiosum. Now once this has been done and the tube which has been inserted over this you can actually close these flaps. So if you split it down right in the center and then you close the flaps over it and you suture it that is how you tubularize the urethral plate over the draining tube. Once that has been done, the glandular flaps that are raised are simply sutured back and this procedure is known as a tip procedure. Now there is also something known as snod graft which is sometimes asked in the viva vos. So in cases where the urethral plate is of a good diameter but you think that the thickness is not enough, you need more um, rigid quality for better development of the tubularization. It can be done as a two-stage technique wherein a graft from either the inner prepucial region or the buccal mucosal graft can be taken, grafted over the urethral plate and then in the second stage you would again incise it down in the center and tubularize over it. Now in uh, nowadays also this technique is modified wherein a layer of waterproofing is done from the inner prepucial region and you can create a flap in that to prevent the leakage and fistula formations but the original technique of tip which is tubularized incised plate that is the urethral plate 
as described by Professor Snodgrass is this basic technique. Namaste and welcome back to the series on hypospadias. Now we will move forward from the um, distal cases and the description of the procedures which were single staged. Now we will begin with the two staged procedure by BRCA and in these cases what happens is that the urethral opening is much more proximal, the urethral plate is not of uh, good quality and the caudi is more pronounced and therefore they are done in two stages. Now the uh, perioperative considerations are going to be similar to that that have been described before. So in the first stage the initial part is to identify the urethral plate. Now this is the opening of the urethral meatus. So the urethral plate is outlined and since this is not of good quality wherein we can um, tubularize it like in case of snodgrass procedure what is done over here is that after the degloving as required and the release of the caudi the glands wings are opened and the urethral plate is outlined now a graft is harvested in the first stage this can be from the inner prepuce which is of a good quality it is of a good match it's like with like or a buccal mucosal graft from the buccal mucosa or from the uh, inner part of the lower lip also can be harvested and according to the amount that is required it is quilted over the urethral plate. Now this is the um, catheter which is uh, shown over here. So that is left in place where the urethral opening is present and the graft is carefully quilted over the entire surface of the urethral plate. Now to make sure it stays in position a good tie over dressing is done so that we have good adherence and good take of the graft. Now the catheter is again left in place, um, the diversion is left in place for about 5 to 7 days and gradually it is removed, the tie over dressing is done. But for the graft uh, maturation we have to wait for a period of 6 months. So the second stage of BRCA is described originally as that which takes place after a period of six months because we want a good graft maturation to take place. So now before the surgery again the urinary diversion um, tube the catheter is placed. Now over here as opposed to the Snodgrass procedure wherein the urethral plate is incised down in the midline this is um, incised on all the edges. So once this graft is lifted on the sides the catheter is passed through it and the graft is folded onto itself and it is sutured. It is sutured to form the tube over it and that is how we are going to tubularize the urethra. Now a waterproofing layer which can be from the dartos muscle or from the tunica vaginalis is also always recommended because obviously it decreases uh, the incidence of leak that decreases the incidence of fistula formation which is quite commonly seen in case of hypospadias and ultimately the closure is done with the closure of the glandular wings and the skin over the shaft. So this is a quick description of what is seen in the two stage uh, BRCA procedure and in the following videos I will describe the other two stage procedures as well.